Hi, welcome to the Signal Pad. In this episode, I have something exciting for you. We'll be taking a look at the Tektronix MSO 6 series. Now, I've done a lot of videos and teardowns on the MSO 5 series, and this is an 8-channel oscilloscope. When the MSO 5 came out, it really disrupted the market, even though 8-channel oscilloscopes did exist before the MSO 5, because of the, some of the functionalities built into the integrated circuits directly, and how the software was written from the ground up to take advantage of those functions, made the MSO 5 series be really valuable and in fact it has influenced how other vendors reacted to that you can see an eight channel oscilloscope announced from keysight in similar way they, they had to respond to the innovations that were built into the mso5 series now the mso6 continues that and it has the same digital down conversion capabilities and advanced triggering in the frequency and phase domain uh, which is quite unique really and the things you can do with it i have to warn you these scopes spoil you because you end up doing things with them and you jump to a different scope and they just can't do the same these are really truly multi-domain scopes even though they're not really called mdos and all the videos that i've done on the mdos begin to show how tektronics was thinking about innovating in this space so i'm really excited because i have a teardown of this as well i have the acquisition board and looking at the acquisition board there are some secrets on it that point on how this mso6 is going to evolve over time so let's go ahead and take a look at the instrument Take a look at the turndown. I have some experiments. Because of this complexity of this unit, I'll probably do this in two videos, but everything is going to be written in the comments section so you can jump to different sections. Let's get started. And here is the Tektronix 6 series up and closed. In terms of industrial design, it is essentially identical to the 5 series, running the same GUI and the same code base. And Tech has done a really good job upgrading the GUI, making it more intuitive and getting rid of some of the subtle bugs it used to have in the past. And at the same time, they're maintaining the code base between 4, 5, and 6 series oscilloscopes, so that way whenever there is an upgrade or something, it applies to all their instruments. You basically have exactly the same experience across now a wide range of their units, which is fantastic. Fantastic. This is a four channel one, a 8 gigahertz, 25 giga sample per second, which is the highest configuration, at least for now. You can get on the 6 series, auxiliary trigger in the front, USB, and so on. They're, these are all identical. The same locking legs that don't uh, fold down, which is quite nice. In terms of controls, again, the same as the 5 series. We have the color coded knobs to the channel selection. That way, you only have one set of controls per channel. Some people don't like that, but honestly, I prefer to have a larger screen anyway. The screen could be a little brighter. This is one of the only complaints I have in terms of its industrial design. I think the screen is a little bit dark. It is at its maximum brightness right now. It looks okay, but if you have a lab that's really bright, maybe it could appear a bit dark. And here is back of the unit. Look at the attention paid to the thermal uh, solution of this in order to create a lot of airflow and keep the noise of the fans down. This is not plastic, by the way. This is aluminum. This must have been an expensive piece of aluminum to punch out, especially because it's curved here on the corners as well. We have DVI, VGA, and DisplayPort allowing you to connect it to a lot of external uh, capture devices and monitors, which is great. We'll try that out as well. And of course, PC connections, traditional things you would expect. We also have an arbitrary function generator output here, which is enabled on this instrument. We can and try it out auxiliary and reference in another of course power we do have some places for cable management and the handle too it's a really nice solid instrument actually it's not that deep and it fits nicely on the bench and here is the main acquisition board for the Tektronix MSO6 and it's a beautiful piece of engineering quite complex with a lot of interesting design and engineering choices that has gone into it that I want to explore a few things to note right off the bat, of course, the highest power consumption devices, which are the ASICs that Tektronix has designed. You can see four of them here. And of course, these things include quite a lot of other functions aside from analog to digital conversion. As I said during the introduction, Tektronix has been in the forefront of innovating in this domain, bringing a lot of interesting capabilities directly at the ASIC level, making it a strong differentiation for their product combined with their software. You also note that the DC-DC converters here are mounted vertically. There are some challenges with doing that because it makes it a little bit more difficult to isolate things, but the space saving is well worth it. Also, on top of that, you can see that the thermal solutions for the DC-DC converters lines up really well with the thermal solutions of everything else. All the fins are in the same direction. Another thing is that these two heat sinks on the side are actually not part of this board, making the design quite interesting in the way the thermal solution is sandwiched between the boards. So we are not seeing the analog inputs yet. They're on the other side. And there's some secrets in this board hidden away, which we're going to discuss and some hints on what could be coming next from them. Two cans here, we're going to open them and see, most likely responsible for the clocking and for getting a really good clock signal to all the data converters here. You can see the memory modules are not populated. This is non, a non-functioning board, but they've just gone with basic DDR memory, which makes sense. Therefore, the memory controller 
and the data handling on how it's stored and retrieved is also built into the ASIC. So one ASIC really does everything here. Uh, another, another component here, most likely an FPGA, some glue logic, just putting things together, PCI Express lane. And there's some stuff here that's a little bit interesting. Let's see if you can catch it by the time we reach the end of the video. Now there's two connectors here. You can see the back of the connectors right over here and here. These two connectors connect the front end to the main acquisition board. And these are hybrid, meaning that they pass DC, you know, potentially clock, analog, and they have to be quite well designed. As a result, it's fairly common to do board to board construction like that. Let's go ahead and separate these and push them apart. There we go. Let's put this aside for a moment. And it's very, very heavy. And here's the front end. And you may have already noticed that there is something unusual about this front end. Well, let's see if you can figure it out. As soon as I flip it over, you'll see it. There we go. And there it is. You can see this is not a four-channel instrument. This is indeed a six-channel instrument. And this tells us that the MSO6 has at least a six-channel option, which is not currently for sale, meaning that they're working on higher order channel count, potentially even eight channels from the way this is designed. We'll take a look at that. And by the time this video is released, maybe they've already announced it. But my guess is that there will be an eight-channel version of this which would be amazing. It will put it in a totally different class, enabling some fairly advanced analysis to be done, especially with the DDC functions built into the data converters. So let's take a look and see what we can figure out. So there's the front end here. You can also see there are six cans here. Here are the connectors I was talking about. Here are the differential lines going to those connectors, clearly coming from the front end. And the front end is performing some functions. We'll have to find out what those are. And another interesting thing is because this thermal section is sandwiched between that board, they're going to have to have heat pipes coming out and going to the side. This is a difficult thing to do. They've decided not to do the heat from the front, most likely because this is basically the front of the instrument. There is no room. You want to keep this as small as possible. That is the first portion that basically is out of your control. Any losses, any anything you have to equalize in this front end is going to be to your disadvantage. So that's why they've chosen co to go this side. That means there is going to be two phase heat pipes going through this. When we take it apart, we will see it. Okay, let's take a look over here. So there we go. So we lift this, we can clearly see the two phase heat pipes connected here. And there's going to be six of them because this is a six channel instrument front end. There's going to be some thermal gradient across the front end because the lengths are different and of course the distance to the heat sinks are not the same but that's okay because that probably minor variation can easily be calibrated out as the instrument is operating and there are built-in calibration functions there so let's put this aside and here's the front end looks really nice these are the famous tech 061 front end ic's which do a lot of the functions we'll talk about that and we do have two that are not populated so there's no reason to populate those channels if the ICs are if that you know the connectors are not there because these are expensive there's no reason to have them but the nice thing about having unpopulated front end is that we can take a look at the footprint and the transition in and out of these ICs fairly well so I'm going to remove this so we can take a look right off the bat you can see a ring over here this is to really isolate uh, this front end from everything else and also prevents from other things like moisture and stuff to get inside but this provides a really nice em shield uh, i already removed a thermal pa paste that was on top of this and there were, there were thermal pads there there was no reason it was just all messy so i got rid of them but yes that's how they do the thermal connection let's take this off so starting from the back we can remove this and yep, we will have further shield. Interesting that they don't have even installed that on these ones. They really are making sure that they don't install anything that is not needed. This, of course, is the shield from channel to channel. Extremely important, especially at low uh, voltage inputs and high gain, because this front end can have a lot of gain. Any coupling from here to here will be amplified by the front end. So if you have, let's say, a, a one volt peak to peak signal here and a one millivolt peak to peak signal here, and you're looking at them at the same time, anything from here to this will be amplified and then you won't know which channel is coming from. So the isolation from these high channel candle oscilloscopes is really, really tough to do, especially when you go to eight channels, which I think this will eventually have to be. So let's take a look at the other side. All right, let's take a close look at this here. So removing the top cover, we see, of course, there are some RF absorbers. This is normal and common technique to avoid any resonances and reflections built inside these kind of cavities. And here's the board itself. Look at that. It's a really beautiful mixed signal design. We see a bunch of connectors at the top. These are most likely the probe connectors. And by the looks of them, there are a lot of pins there to probably pass on the digital signals too, which means that all the digital inputs would have to make it to these connectors. Remember, the ADC resources are used when the digital inputs are activated. And that's the flex uh, probe input architecture that Tektronix has come up with. If you also look at the way the analog signals are dealt with, there's a lot we can learn from, especially from the ones that are not populated. 
If you look at the BNC input, the BNC input comes in, gets transformed to a coplanar waveguide, and then there are two electromechanical relays that it encounters. These are both made by Teledyne. And you may ask, well, why, you know, why electromechanical relays, why not other kinds of switches? That's because from the BNC input all the way to the first IC, which is a front-end IC take is made, the signal has to remain as linear, as low noise, and as high dynamic range as possible. And going through solid state devices makes that quite difficult. Nonetheless, this instrument supports 50 ohm and 1 mega ohm simultaneously, which means that we'd have to have a way of switching between them. And because the high speed path has to be well maintained, even for switching into 1 mega ohm, they're using an electromechanical relay. And you can see that input right over here, which then after the 50 ohm line turns into a very thin line, because that's, again, it's only 1 mega ohm, so it doesn't matter. But that is also further process. There's a relay here, and that relay is almost certainly switching between AC and DC coupled inputs. You can only have AC coupled inputs and the 1 mega ohm input, of course, some protection circuitry. And then there's another custom IC. I see that signal coming out differential into this chip. Now, even though uh, we're on the one mega ohm path, it seems like they're doing some processing here, probably ap amplification, converting to differential, and they pass that to the same signal. This could be trigger also related, I'm not quite sure, but nonetheless, the signal path goes through here and then to the ADC, because ultimately this is the only IC here that speaks with the ADCs directly. On the RF side, we have a signal that uh, splits again. So here's a 50 ohm continuing. And on this relay, we have two paths, a single ended path going this way and a single path going this way. But on this side, we have some attenuators. This is quite beneficial because this passive resistive attenuators allows you to reduce the signal when it's very high before it hits the IC, making the upper dynamic range design of this chip quite a bit simpler. And then this chip does a lot of functions. It first of all converts everything to differential. It has all the amplifiers, the range control, potentially some trigger functions. Now I'm a bit surprised based on what I know is that this signal, this uh, IC over here, actually does not do any sampling. You would expect that there'd be some sampling on these. It certainly splits the signal into two, and it does that because the ADCs are time interleaved. So it has to split that so that each of the two ADCs that follows it will then clock an opposing signal, polarities, and that's a very classic time interleave architecture. The ADCs themselves may be further time interleaved, as it is uh, typical for these kind of ADCs. You can see all the signals reaching this connector over here. I'll zoom in a bit closer here so we can see the transition in and out of this IC, especially since the package is missing here. There are some other lines going in, and there are some of them are AC coupled or differentially transformer coupled, which is what makes me really surprised that there is no uh, clocking in here, there's no sampling. But indeed, perhaps some trigger functions are handled through this because there are other high-speed signals that make it to this connector, and the direction is not quite clear at the moment. But nonetheless, I think that the architecture is fairly straightforward from that point of view, it means that each of these channels will occupy two of these differential lines going into the ADC. And there is, of course, here we have six channels. But the board would probably have to handle eight channels. That's the only way something like this can be built. As soon as you build six channels, you're basically using eight, uh, equivalent of eight channels of uh, ADC ICs. Yeah, there's nothing else really in here that, that we can talk about. I think on the other side, yeah, on the other side, there's not much. I just put those connectors so I can have a nice angle here for you guys to take a look. I'm going to zoom in a little bit more so we can see some of these transitions and compare some of the channels. And here we are. We can see the transitions in uh, the chip. Uh, it's quite nice. Of course, uh, these unpopulated channels allow us uh, further insight into what's going on. So here's the attenuators that are not populated compared to this one. There are advantages I forgot to mention that when you have an attenuator passive like this, you can also have extra input protection because if you have a very fast detector, as soon as you find out that the signal overload condition exists, you can quickly switch this into this path and then protect this chip that follows after. So I'm sure that's built into it. Something unusual is that uh, these traces have, are disrupted. It looks like there's room for something to be put in here, but that doesn't exist on these ones, which is unusual. I wonder what's going on here. Is it some kind of a prototype or is are exploring some architectures that I don't know about? But nonetheless, interesting to see. You can see the differential lines, how they're handled, missing bumps around it, creating a nice transition from a ground signal, signal ground pad of a BGA package onto a differential line. These are all have to be electromagnetically simulated carefully and modeled in order to get a nice frequency response. Looks quite nice. I think we can look at the ADC board now that we know how the front end works. And here's the acquisition board. I have taken off the heat sink over here, the cans, and also the heat sink on this. So here we have an Altera ARIA FPGA, clearly connected to some memory here, probably controlling this PCI Express interface to display and other things, most likely, and just glue logic for everything. 
So here's the main IC. This is the IC that Tektronix has designed. It's a single die, probably 65 nanometer, maybe 45 nanometer CMOS. I doubt that it's anything smaller than that. You can see two differential lines going into it. There's also two additional ones on the other side of the board, which means that each of these can actually handle two channels in this configuration from the way the front end was designed. So this is an eight-channel board. This is a, an MSO6 eight-channel oscilloscope that doesn't exist yet, which is pretty cool to see here on the bench. Uh, the interface here to DDR memory has some advantages and some disadvantages. The advantage is that you're using commodity hardware for your memory, and you have to just build a simple DDR memory interface as opposed to using something like the Keysight's ultra high performance, you know, hypercube memory thing, where you have to really customize for very, very fast memory transfer. So you may give up some memory transfer, but then it reduces the cost of the development significantly and is probably good enough for something like this. Again, going over here, we see a section where we have our OCXO, 100 megahertz, and this is going to be the heart of the entire oscilloscope's clock. Very stable. This is important for long acquisitions of long uh, chains where you want to maintain the timing accuracy. Uh, some clocking over here, of course, to create and you know the references you need. There's a PLL chip here that can work up to uh, 8 gigahertz, probably running at 6.25. Here we have another chip that works all the way up to 12 and a half gigahertz. This is a VCO. It does have a divided output, and you can see that they're bringing in here, dividing it, dividing it, and using it to close the loop. So here's our PLL loop over here. The output of that also shows up here, which is divided further between three mini circuit amplifiers filtered over here and then divided again. So we have one, two, three Wilkinsons. That's six different outputs. I wonder how they're routing all of that out. But obviously, this is running either at 6.25 gigahertz or so, which I think it should be because this Wilkinson and this Wilkinson are the same size. So probably 6.25, which is consistent with the MSO5, and it's also consistent with the 25 giga sample per second that this instrument runs. Even if it's running at 12 and a half, it'd be the same thing because you have a multiple of that clock that is passed everywhere. Everything has to be synchronized, and there are probably ways to align these clocks to each other. Uh, aside from that, there is one thing missing on here, which maybe you've noticed by now. There are no power connectors. There is nothing that gives this thing power. Now, it cannot be through these. These are too small. I, I guess it could come from the PCI Express, although I highly doubt that. But there are some hints that I thought uh, might be responsible. If you look over here, some of these screws are labeled as not ground. So it's possible that there is some kind of a power bar where they screw this into the power bar, and that's how they push power into the many copper layers of this board. This mu board must be, I don't know, 18 year layers, 16 layers. So there's a lot of stuff happening uh, in, the, in between the layers which we cannot see. And if you look carefully, you can see some of the lines running around. So yeah, it, these screws will be able to handle a lot of current. And this thing is going to need a lot of current because look at, look at how many DC-DC converters there are. So yeah, it's possible, although it's a bit unusual. And I'm sure there's nothing on the other side of the board. You know, a few more components here and there, but it's fairly flat. Yeah, so we kind of get an idea of how this works. Exciting to see basically an eight-channel instrument here on the bench. So let's go back and do some experiments now that we know how this works and see how the instrument performs. So here's the setup of our first device under test. What we have here is an analog device's multi-gigahertz PLL. It's a fairly complex IC. It has both integer and fraction and operation. And we'll take a look at some of its capabilities. It has a differential output. I have terminated one into 50 ohms. And the other output of the PLL is directly going into channel one of the Tektronix 6 series oscilloscope. At the same time, the reference of the PLL, I'm also overriding and taking it externally and allows us to investigate some of the behavior of the PLL using the external reference. We'll talk about that. Here's the power, and here's a USB interface that allows you to convert to SPI and configure the PLL from a PC. So this setup is really nice, but it is really difficult to measure because the only thing we're looking at is the RF output of the PLL. So if I want to extract dynamic behavior, locking behavior, or some of the subtle limitations of the PLL by only looking at this RF output, that's quite difficult to do on traditional oscilloscopes. And I want to see how the Tektronix 6 series handles that with the digital down conversion and the software that's built into it. So that's going to be pretty interesting. Let's take a look at the setup a little bit more. So at the same time, I have a PC over here, which I'm using to configure this, of course. And I'm using the Keatley 2281S-20-6. This is a high precision power supply. And look at the number of digits here and measurement of the current. Very low noise power supply, excellent for this PLL work here. And of course, at the top, we have the MSO 6 series. So you can access the scope remotely by typing its IP address onto any browser. And then the instrument control e-scope is available right over here. 
And there it is. This is a replica of the instrument's original screen that I'm looking at directly on the LCD. And in fact, even when I move the mouse, the mouse moves on the instrument as well. The frame rate here is obviously not as high as the frame rate on the oscilloscope and the update rate of the waveform is much faster, but you can access the scope like this basically from anywhere in the world as long as you have an internet connection to the oscilloscope. We can even go ahead and make this a full screen and now you really have a nice view of the oscilloscope. So right now there is nothing on the screen. Let's take a look at the PLL software. So here's the PLL software. This is from Hittite. You can see that the PLL is already configured and it says that the PLL is locked and the output frequency is 2.4 gigahertz. So there is something supposed to be coming out of the PLL. So let's go back to the scope over here. The reason we don't see anything is because we have a 1 mega ohm input selected with a 500 megahertz bandwidth. So I'm going to change that to 50 ohms over here. And as soon as I do that, we see a huge signal. Let's go ahead and change the vertical scale to 200 millivolt per scale. There it is, there's some signal indeed present. I can change the horizontal scale here so we can take a closer look at the waveform. And there's our waveform, it looks okay. It's not perfectly sinusoidal because the PLL output has some nonlinearities and harmonics associated with it, but it is a nice stable signal. Now I can do some measurements on this directly from the scope. Let's go ahead and measure, let's say, its amplitude. And I can also measure from the time measurement settings here, the frequency, okay? Now, let's also note how many measurements there are here built into the scope itself. Now, some of these measurements, like the jitter on power and so on, are extra options, but Tech has done a fantastic job of creating a unified feel with guidelines and graphical representations of what exactly you're measuring, tons of different, different diverse measurements for a wide variety of applications. And I'm eager to show you things like Jitter. I have an experiment for that separately. You can do power measurements. There's a lot of really cool things you can do with it. I'm pretty impressed with how much software they've written for these instruments. So let's go back here. Here's amplitude 1.1 volt, frequency 2.4 gigahertz, which is exactly what we expect. And if you double click on this, you can do things like histogram trends and capture statistical data, set pass and fail and fill and do all kind of filters on it. It's really great. Lots of cool things you can do directly on the measurements as you add them. So let's go back to the PLL software here. I'm going to change the frequency up by 50 megahertz. There it is. You can see that it shifted briefly and then we have 2.45 gigahertz and I can come back down and it will shift again. That's great, it works, but it doesn't tell us much about what happens between those two frequencies and how well did the PLL handle those switching. So there's a lot of information you can capture if you were to download the data from the scope, post-process it yourself, and figure this out offline. But because the instrument has digital down conversion built into it and can do all kind of correlated measurements, you can capture all of these directly into the, in the unit. Uh, and that's what I meant by saying that it spoils you because it gives you so much a capability right in the, in the oscilloscope. So let's explore some of those. Now the very first thing is that I'm going to enable spectrum view, which is uh, one of the primary functions of the digital down conversion that, that's built in there. I'm going to turn it on. Now as soon as I turn it on, I get a second screen here. Let's go under the spectrum settings. So you can see I'm looking at a span of two gigahertz. Now that's a lot of data. Once you set the span, which is two gigahertz is a maximum span you can do on the MSO6, once you set it to 2 gigahertz, the amount of data the oscilloscope needs to write into the DDR memory is huge. As a result, the maximum samples it can collect in the time domain becomes more limited. That's why the waveform doesn't look as smooth as it used to, is because you're getting closer to the aliasing of the signal itself. Just keep that in mind, at 2 gigahertz span, you will have some limitations on how much, how fast you can capture data. That's just, that's just the way it is, that's the way the memory throughput is built into this unit. So let's go ahead and reduce the span. We don't need two gigahertz anyway in this case. Here we go, we have a two, 200 megahertz span. Everything looks normal. And we don't see anything because the sender frequency is not at 2.4 gigahertz. We can change that. There it is, here's our tone in the middle. It looks nice. You can see that it has some strange behavior around the closing phase noise of this tone, but that's because I'm using an arbitrary wave from generator as the reference to the PLL, which is typically not what you're supposed to be doing. I'm doing that because I wanna run some experiments with it. Okay, so here's our tone, it matches this frequency, that's great. I can go back to the PLL once again, I can change the frequency up. You can see that it sh shifts all the way over here. I can shift it down and it will shift back. So that all makes sense. Now, if you look at the time domain and the frequency domain, because this is done in the ASICs, in the digital domain, this is none of this is correlated in terms of what you're looking at. So you can change the horizontal spacing all you want to anything you want. So let me click on this one more time. 
I can go ahead and look at much, much farther away, and you can see there is absolutely no change on the spectrum view because it's done completely independently. There it is. The settings for the spectrum can be set here, things like resolution bandwidth and what kind of windowing is used. You can do those independently of the time domain signal. So we're looking at now a, a lot of time domain signal. And this bar at the bottom represents the portion of this time domain signal where the spectrum is com computed based on. So if I do a single measurement like this, and I can go ahead and grab this and move it around. You can see that the spectrum changes. Now, obviously, the tone is always there, so you don't see any difference between different windows. I'm going to run that again. Okay, that's good. Now I want to catch the moment where the PLL changes frequency. And in order to do that, I'm going to take advantage of one more critical capability of this instrument, which is the ability to plot things like magnitude, frequency, or phase of the signal in real time as it's computing the spectrum. So let's look at the frequency in real time. When I enable that, I will get a new curve. And that curve here is at the bottom. And you can see right now it's just a flat line. That the reason it's a flat line is because this is a CW tone. It's not moving around. So of course, as a function of time, the sender frequency is constant. And it will show you how much that sender frequency deviates from the center of the spectrum to frequencies. Right now it's not deviating, so it's flat. Let's go back to the PLL. I'm going to go ahead and shift the frequency up again by 50 megahertz, and I expect this line to move up. There it is. You can see it moved up. But notice how in between we get a, a region where things are just not computed. That means that something is going on in between those switching. We just don't know what it is yet. But it also looks like that it takes a really long time between the switching of the two, which means I have to catch a huge amount of data if I want to understand the dynamic behavior. So there's a few things we need to set up before we can do that. First of all, we have to go under the trigger and change the trigger instead of triggering on the analog signal, which is a traditional oscilloscope on the rising edge, for instance. Instead of that, I'm going to ask to trigger on frequency versus time. So now I have the ability of triggering in amplitude and in the frequency totally different way of catching a signal change than a traditional oscilloscope does. So let's put this on frequency versus time, and I'm going to set that level to 25 megahertz which is right in the middle of the change in frequency I'm applying at 50 megahertz. There it goes. There's a trigger line right there. So every time it crosses that, we can force the instrument to trigger. Now, this is not looking at a very long timeline. It's only looking at two microseconds per division. So I'm going to set the instrument to look at a much, much wider amount of data, longer duration. So for that, we're going to go into the manual mode here. And we're going to make sure that the sample rate does not drop below a certain amount so we can catch everything without aliasing. So we're going to keep the sample at 3.125 gigasample per second. And I'm going to increase this until we get something close to, let's say, yeah, 4 milliseconds. What is the next one? That's 10. Okay. So 4 milliseconds, I think, per division is going to be okay. I can also increase this year. And if I do that, you can see that I will get an equivalent change in the horizontal scale. Now the scope is capturing a huge amount of data. So it's going to take a long time for it to capture, process, and display. I'm also going to set the trigger to 10%. And that's going to put the trigger over here. A couple of other things I need to do. I'm also going to change the trigger mode from auto to normal. So now the instrument is waiting, waiting for a change in the frequency. And as soon as that change happens, a new trigger will happen. So I'm going to go back to the PLL, and I'm going to shift the PLL up by 50 megahertz, like so. There you go. So you can see that it's triggered. Now it's capturing, so it's going to take a while. It's storing the data, and then let's see how long it takes for it to display. Just appreciate how much stuff is happening. So it's calculating the spectrum, it's calculating the frequency shift, and displaying time and all, all at the same time. And look at that. This is a very interesting plot. So at the beginning, the frequency is where it's supposed to be, 2.4 gigahertz. Then there's a huge duration of time where the frequency is unknown. It means that it's outside of this window, and then it settles down to exactly where it's supposed to go. And this tiny, tiny slit line that you see here, that's the duration where the spectrum is being computed. And that gives you a sense of scale of how much data is here. So I can go ahead and grab this and bring it all the way, put it over here. There's our tone. You can see at the beginning, we were sitting at 2.4 gigahertz. And I can take this and dra drag it over here. The signal disappears. Okay, so I can drag it once again all the way out here. 
and there it is look at that sitting at 2.45 gigahertz so it's exactly what we want but now we have all the data we need we know it, it takes about 30 milliseconds for the signal to shift from one frequency to another frequency we also know that there is signal present because you can see it in the time domain but you don't see it in the frequency domain which means it went outside of the 200 megahertz window we see that there is some tiny overshoot here in the time domain before the signal settles but then it settles and it continues i want you to appreciate how hard it is to capture this in any other way it will take a lot of post-processing or a lot of different instruments to be able to do this we don't have access to the digital io we're only looking at the rf signal so it's pretty impressive that we can do this at all Another important thing to consider is that all of this data has already been captured at 3.125 gigasample per second. So you can look at it by zooming into it. So I can go ahead and enable the zoom function. And now I can look at this data and I can zoom in a lot. Just, just look at how many times I can zoom in before I even see a waveform. Look at that. I can just keep going. And that data is still in memory. And it captures and restores it quite fast. So I can now drag this and try and put it right at the transition where the signal transitions from one to there it is. Okay, I just caught it. Let me zoom back out a little bit. You can see I can move it to the left a little bit and to the right a little bit. And here is the signal, so you can see the tone, the frequency has shifted. So it tells me that the frequency for which the PLL sits on before it's locked, there it is, there's our transition right here. There you go. So I just caught it. I can now zoom in further and then look at that data. So anyway, there's a lot of things you can do because the data is available. Therefore, you can zoom in and drag and, and do all kind of things that you would do with a huge amount of uh, data that's been captured there. So that tells us about how the PLL shifts from one frequency to another frequency, which would be quite difficult to catch otherwise. But I also want to know how does the PLL react to this reference? And that's even a tougher measurement to make. So let's continue analyzing this PLL. So let's take a look at this block diagram. I can look at the block diagram over here. So as you can see, this PLL operates on a 50 megahertz reference currently, and it has a prescaler in the front and as well as a loop filter and everything that you would expect from uh, the PLL itself. The loop filter has a certain frequency response. We don't know what that is, but we want to find out. And there's a VCO there which uh, directly produces a 2.4 gigahertz output. So I showed you that in the setup that this reference was coming from an arbitrary waveform generator. So what I also did that I split it now and I'm taking the reference to the second channel of the oscilloscope, simultaneously applying it to the PLL as well. So let's go ahead back to the PLL. Let me close that. Let's go and enable channel 2 of the, of the oscilloscope here. There it is. That's our reference. Now, this is at 50 megahertz. We're looking at it, obviously, from very, very far away. But I also want to look at this in the frequency domain, which means I can enable spectrum view at the same time on channel 2. Let's go ahead and do that. Spectrum view, turning it on. And, of course, as soon as I do that, the spectrum view on channel 2 and channel 1 are both at a center frequency of 2.4 gigahertz. Believe it or not, this instrument allows you to set the center frequency totally separately on each channel because this is done via a separate hardware DDC engine. So you can do them at any frequency you want. So let's go ahead and open that. Let's un uncheck this. And let's set ch channel 2 here to 50 megahertz. And there it is. We can see it's exactly what we were expecting. Here's our 50 megahertz reference. And you can also see the output at 2.4 gigahertz has quite a bit more phase noise. That's the far out phase noise of the VCO along with the loop characteristic. So right now the reference is steady and the output frequency is steady. You can see here we have frequency versus time of the output frequency itself. I'm also going to enable the same thing, frequency versus time, for the reference too. And I can do that by going to spectrum view and enable frequency versus time. There it is. So you can see it's also sitting uh, quite flat. Now this is at 10 megahertz per division. The reference is not going to move that much. So I'm going to change that from 10 megahertz per division. Let's go to something much smaller. Actually, let's go to 150 kilohertz per division, about 10 times uh, less uh, than this one. Okay. Now it's interesting that this, this is quite noisy. Now I can't quite figure out why that is. It could be uh, some rounding errors in the oscilloscope, a firmware that could be fixed this, or maybe this is some timing uncertainty. The reference of the scope is locked to the reference of the synthesizer, so I'm not quite sure why this is, but it's okay. For our, for our purposes, it's a, it's a constant reference. So now what? Well, now I can change and apply an FM modulation directly to the reference. So think about what that would do. If I move the reference back and forth in frequency, 
the output frequency will also move back and forth, but it would move back and forth by a much larger amount because it's going through the multiplication factor from 50 to 2.4 gigahertz. So I'm gonna go ahead and enable that and let's see what happens. There it is, <laughs> and check it out. That's exactly what we were expecting. Look at the reference. The reference is changing up and down and it's changing by about 500 kilohertz in total but the output frequency is changing by a lot more than that and that's expected because you get the multiplication. You can see the reference move back and forth a little bit but you can see the output jump back and forth a lot. The reason you don't see a single tone has to do with the resolution bandwidth that I've set. I'll give you an example. So right now resolution bandwidth is 1k to 1. Let's go ahead and change it to 10k to 1 and you can see a more spread out, more like an FM modulation that you would expect to see. So here's the deviation of the reference and here is the deviation of the output. So right now everything is moving around. We're going to take advantage of the triggering capabilities of the scope once again and trigger on the frequency variation instead of on the time variation. I'm going to change that. We can do it under channel 1 or channel 2. Both of them are fine. Let's go on channel 1 and there you go. Look at that everything is steady. We're, we're looking at every time triggering on frequency versus time. Every time we cross zero, we trigger and we capture the entire thing. This is beautiful. This is crazy that you can do this on an oscilloscope without doing anything. It's all built into the hardware itself. So we can now measure the exact frequency deviation and we can measure the uh, frequency deviation of the reference and the output. But there's also an asymmetry in the behavior, which is the main reason why I wanted to show you this. Look at this, you can see here that this is not quite sinusoidal at the very top. Now we can investigate this if I increase the frequency deviation more than the 500 kilohertz. Let me try that. So I went ahead and I increased the frequency deviation from 500 kilohertz to 750 kilohertz. And now the response is completely different. So I want you to think about why, why that happens. Let me change the trigger while I give you a few moments to think about this. I'm gonna change this from Let's put this at minus 15 so we get a nicer triggering point. There we go. There it is. So look at what's happening. At the bottom swing of the frequency deviation, we have no problem. We follow the reference. You can see the reference is perfectly sinusoidal here. We follow the bottom swing perfectly fine, but at the very top, it becomes flat. And the reason is because the VCO is at the edge of its locking region at 2.4 gigahertz in this configuration. So when the VCO, when the, when the frequency reference goes back and forth, at some point the VCO cannot keep up with that reference. It needs to change the settings, but because the settings are not changed, it just loses lock. So it loses lock briefly, and then it catches the lock very quickly. There's a period that it actually oscillates before it fully captures it. Let me zoom in. It's a very subtle PLL behavior here. There we go, you can see it now even better. There it is, so here, it loses lock. It's just sh looking for lock again. It catches the lock, there's a brief overshoot, that's a type two response from the PLL, and then it continues catching again, and it loses lock again, and then loses again, comes back. So this response of the PLL, by forcing the frequency back and forth of the rest, is a very subtle measurement, and a very hard one to perform. But because we have all these time correlated measurements across multiple channels, we can clearly see at what point the reference and the output frequency become uncorrelated. And we can even see the locking behavior of the PLL on each cycle that it repeats. I think this is pretty amazing that you can do this. So just wanted to give you an idea by measuring this PLL. Of course, we didn't even look at the digital signals coming in. If you look at that, then you can time correlate them with the configuration digits and you can just spend hours doing these measurements. So let's put this aside and shift now to a different experiment and take a look at some of these eye quality measurements and jitter measurements that are now built into the scope as well. So for our next experiment, we're going to take a look at some high-speed communication over a backplane emulation board. So this is at several traces here. We have 10 inch, 15 inch, 40 inch, and so on. So we're using a 10 inch one because I also have quite a long cable connecting to it. So I'm using this in a single-ended fashion. So the signal comes over here, some serial data, and serial data leaves this board. And here we have another line where I'm imposing a signal in order to investigate crosstalk. So the output of this board on one side is obviously connected to the MSO6, sitting right over there. And all the way on the left over here, we have a, an Agilent 4901B, which is our bit error rate test that you can generate some arbitrary patterns. So having said that, let's go ahead and take a look and see what actually comes out of this board and how we can investigate the nature of the signal and debug the kind of problems it may have.
And here is this serial data stream on channel one. You can see there's a lot of data going through. So we can go ahead and zoom in a little bit more so we can see a bit more nature of the data. There it is. I can also change the trigger so that it triggers on both edges. There you go. Looks nice. I mean, it's a bunch of random data. It obviously looks really choppy here, but on the screen, it looks much, much better and it updates much faster. This is because of the remote connection. I also apologize for the noise. There's a lot of equipment on to make this measurement. So now that we have this, we can do a few things. We can take a look at it, let's say, with persistence and so on. But because we have so much advanced jitter measurements built into the oscilloscope, we can just use that. Let's go under jitter. There's a lot of measurements here you can do, but the jitter summary is a really good one to start with because it gives you kind of an overview of what the eye diagram looks like, and then we can take a look at that detail. Let's go ahead and add that. As soon as I add that, we're going to get several different windows and a whole bunch of measurements. And right now, the record length isn't long enough, so it cannot capture the data and analyze it. So we can go ahead and change the record length here by looking at it from a bit farther away. In fact, we can go ahead and look at a ton of data. Let's look at you know, two microseconds per division. That's a lot of data. This is at 3.125 gigabit per second. There it is. So right off the bat, we see some really interesting characteristics. So here's our eye diagram. And the CDR inside the instrument has locked to this and is analyzing various jitter characteristics and how the edges are behaving over time and decomposing the jitter into many different components. You can go under the measurement setting and you can go under the configuration and change the way different measurements are made. But more importantly, you can go under the clock recovery and set how the CDR behaves. You can change it, the, the way it extracts the clock, what kind of time constant it has, and many, many other parameters, which is quite nice. I'm not gonna change it right now. We're gonna leave it at default. But if you have a particularly difficult set of data that's hard to catch and for a CDR, you can change the parameters to help the instrument find the correct CDR parameters. Okay, there it is. So look at this eye for a second. First of all, we can see that there is two edges. So it has very classic double edging uh, behavior. Normally double edging can happen due to ISI if the channel has a very particular frequency response. So you may be tempted to say that this is ISI and double edging due to ISI. But looking at it a bit more carefully, there are some things that makes you, make me kind of doubt that. First of all, the middle here is filled in with data. It shouldn't be. Normally with an ISI that is so clean, you shouldn't have that. But more importantly, if you look at this measurement, you see that the data-dependent jitter is 41 picosecond, and PJ, which is random jitter, is 92 picosecond. So most of this jitter is actually random, it's not data dependent, which means it's not due to intersymbol interference. So that right off the bat means that there is something causing this kind of jitter in this eye, and we need to look at it more carefully. Now, nice because of this, all these plots that are available, we can just look at the TIA histogram, which is a time interval error extracted from the edges of the data after the CDR locks by the instrument, we see that we have two almost Gaussian distributions that's from the double edging. So this corresponds to this edge and this one then corresponds to this edge. And, you know, they're fairly well behaved within their own edge, but there is two of them, meaning that, again, there is some double edging behavior. But more importantly and more interestingly, if I look at the TIE spectrum, I can see some tones present. It means that the nature of the TIE has some periodicity to it. It's just that that periodicity has nothing to do with the data. It is as if an independent source is responsible for the jitter that we see. This is a very difficult problem to track down normally. And because we have the TIE histogram and the TIE spectrum, we can right off the bat note that this tone here must be an imposing signal on the jitter. So the transmitter's CDR and the transmitter's PLL must be doing this. So we can now go and hunt for this tone and eliminate it. And that would be a starting point. And at the same time, we can see the bathtub is still fairly open, even all the way down to 1 times 10 to the minus 15 bit error rate, because the middle of the eye is so open. And that's not that surprising. So this tone, uh, observing this tone here in the TIE is very helpful in debugging this. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the signal off that is responsible for this double edging so that we can see what happens to the TIE spectrum. Now keep an eye on that. I'm going to turn it off. I'm also going to clear the screen and take a look at it now. It looks considerably better. The double edging is completely gone away. We can see that we only now have one of the histograms. We don't have the double edging anymore. You can see eye is much, much more open. 
And you can see also the TIE spectrum no longer has a tone, that the distribution of the spectrum of the edges is quite a bit better than it used to be. Also, if I look at this measurement here, you can see the data dependent jitter is 41 picosecond, but now the random jitter is uh, you know, around one picosecond. So significantly better. The eye has become quite a lot better. Let's go ahead and add a couple more measurements to this. You can go under jitter. Let's measure some eye characteristics. We can measure the eye height. Let's add that. We can measure the eye width. We can add that as well. We can also add the Q factor all to the same window. There you go. You can also look at the trend of this and how they change with time, just like with any other measurement. So the type of analysis you can do on any measurement you add to this uh, is basically the same across all the measurements the oscilloscope can do, which is quite nice. Now there is another type of signal that can mess up our eye diagram. And I'm going to go ahead and enable that and we can see how different it looks than the, than the one that you see here. The reason that one's different and difficult to analyze compared to this is because this was an edge problem. The other one's going to be an amplitude problem and it's going to look very different. Okay, I'm going to turn on the other imposing signal. There we go. You can see right off the bat that the eye begins to degrade very quickly. And if I wait long enough, you can see where the eye spends most of its time and we can extract information from that. But if you look at this, there wasn't really much difference in the jitter. The jitter didn't change at all. In fact, the spectrum, uh, the entire TIE spectrum moved up, but there's no distinct tone in there to tell us that there is a problem. That's because this spectrum is the spectrum of the edges, not the spectrum of the signal itself. In order to find out why this eye is degraded, since the edges did not move, we're going to have to look at that in the spectrum domain in order to be able to extract that information. Let's see if there is an imposing signal that we can find. I'm going to go over here. And I'm going to go under spectrum view. I'm going to add spectrum view one more time. I'm just going to add it over there. So there's some settings I'm going to have to change in order to make it a little bit easier for you to see. Let's go ahead and move this so we can see the spectrum better. Let's go under the setting here. And we don't need to look at 2 gigahertz, that's a lot. And by the way, the reason the eye changed when I enabled the spectrum has, is for the same reason, because we lost some of the samples. So you have to be careful with that. So let's go ahead and let's look at a 100 megahertz span. There we go. So now things are very different. If I look at this, I see a lot of tones. And that's expected. That means that this signal is periodic. It means that there is some repeated pattern that happens at a certain rate. That's why we get these individual tones. In fact, if you measure the frequency difference between two of these tones, and if you know the data rate, you can calculate the, the uh, sequence's length. In this particular case, it's 2 to the 11 minus 1 through the random bits that are coming through. So I don't see anything unusual. You can see all these tones have the same amplitude. There are no other tones. This tone that you see here is from the scope itself. We can now span, we can zoom around and see if we can find anything. Let's go and look at some lower frequencies. Let's look at, let's say, 200 megahertz. See if you can see anything at 200 megahertz. No, it still looks good. You can see all the tones are still present. Let's go a little bit lower. See if we see any low frequency signals that are jumping in our data. And ah, there it is. Look at that. Right over here, there is a tone that shouldn't be there. This tone is outside of the periodicity of the signal and it's sitting somewhere and it's quite strong, it's bigger than all the other individual tones, and it's sitting at 88 megahertz. So this is now in the amplitude domain. We can catch it with the spectrum view while simultaneously looking at the eye diagram. So if I go ahead and turn the imposing signal off, I expect this to go away. And then the eye diagram should look better. So let's try that out. I'm going to go ahead and turn it off. There it is. You can see the signal has disappeared. I'm going to clear the screen. There we go. Clearing the screen again. And we can see the eye diagrams back to normal. And we are getting the numbers that we were getting before. So you can see how with the combination of the built-in CDR as well as spectrum view, you can analyze eye diagrams in, in the frequency domain when it's suitable to analyze them in the frequency domain, or you can look at them in the phase domain and in the jitter domain when the problems are on the eye crossings. This is just scratches the surface. There's a lot of other things you can do with this, but I just wanted to give you kind of a flavor of the stuff that tech has built into this scope now. One of the features that I wish it would have, that at least I don't think it has, is the ability to apply equalization, to be able to extract what kind of equalization parameters you would need to open an eye that has ISI on it. To the best of my knowledge, I don't think that is possible at the moment, 
because all I see is the analysis of the jitter, but not to correct it. And I think that if they add something like that, it would be nice. It would also be a good competing feature against Keysight, which does this in their oscilloscopes as well. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this first part review of the Tektronix 6 series. I'm really eager to see the stuff that we discovered during teardown, how that would build into the evolution of this machine and how it would be improved and potentially an 8-channel version be available. 2020 is a great year to buy a oscilloscope. A lot of innovations from many different companies. And it's clear that tech has put a huge amount of effort putting the software and hardware of these units. So I've always really enjoyed using them. If you like this review, let me know. It takes a lot of effort to produce these because I want to make sure that I do these instruments justice to show you what they're capable of doing and at the same time discuss measurement techniques that hopefully would be useful to you in the future. So keep an eye out for part two. There are other stuff that I'm going to do in the meanwhile. As always, I'll see you in the comment section.